In 2004, the University of Oklahoma's President, David L. Boren, created the Presidential Dream Courses. These courses offer OU faculty the opportunity to dream, crafting a unique community of learners, networking some of the world's best scholars to engage OU students. As a result, the University of Oklahoma offers courses and degrees that compete internationally, equipping students for bright futures. Select faculty at the University of Oklahoma are awarded funds to enhance semester-long courses already scheduled for the academic year. This funding brings in several content experts during the semester to interact with students in the community. The visiting experts often deliver public lectures, helping to celebrate teaching and learning, empowering dedicated faculty to build a community of learning in Oklahoma and beyond. Students and others interact with visitors of influence and importance in policymaking, strategic planning, and scholarship as they network with academic leaders and researchers. We invite you to explore the learning and teaching dreams of OU's esteemed faculty, helping your own dreams grow larger than you ever imagined. Well, thank you, Andreana, for that very generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to speak today about social obligation, but I need to start by observing that this is not such a simple thing to do these days. For the social in social obligation is not what it used to be. It is not only that long established conceptions of the social have been in recent years criticized or rethought. Even the very existence of the social is nowadays disputed. Peter Miller and Nicholas Rose have invited us to contemplate what they once called the death of the social. Bruno Latour famously rejects the concept of society altogether, that decaying monster he has termed it, and would have us speak of the social instead only to index a diffuse process of associating things into assemblies. In the domain of global health, meanwhile, Tobias Reis has reported in his innovative work on the Gates Foundation that the social is there rapidly vanishing in favor of a new object of knowledge and intervention called humanity, which global health practitioners understand as a biologically rather than politically constituted unit. There is much more I could say about the recent troubles of our old friend, the social. Here I only want to observe that they do seem to make life very difficult for anything that we would call social obligation. For the social in social obligation refers not to a biological population or a network of actants or a set of economically interested agents linked by markets. It refers, as Durkheim insisted, to a moral unity. The social implies a society, that is, a certain kind of collective self with binding obligations on its members. And projects of social criticism of nearly all stripes have long relied on this conception, in which belonging to a society brings with it certain binding and morally sanctioned obligations. But what is a society today? And what does social obligation really mean? We're still haunted by the old 19th century idea of society as a membership organization, and by the related premise that it is principally the nation state that defines and bounds a society, a conception that was central both to the birth of the social sciences and to the foundation of social insurance, social welfare, and other sorts of, as we say, social policy. Yet when we confront the great challenges of our time, that old equation of society with a collectivity of authorized members of a nation state fails us spectacularly. The problem is evident when we deal with non-citizens within our national borders. Here, conceptions of rights and political community rooted in nationality and citizenship confront the harsh reality that many of those most in need of state services and social support are not juridical members of the society. 
The problem is perhaps no less obvious when we try to grasp how social obligation applies to those in grievous need in lands that are foreign but hardly unrelated to our own. Here it's perhaps enough to simply say the word Syria. How to think of social obligation in these cases? And what is the relevant society that would ground that obligation? Merely national solidarities fail us, while appeals to an imagined global society seem to have little force or efficacy. Indeed, we may wishfully invoke abstractions like global citizenship or the world community, but it is clear that these can, under present circumstances, sustain only the weakest sort of obligation. That is the kind we call humanitarian. In the recent book that Andreana referred to, I wrote about the possibilities and dangers raised by new anti-poverty programs that directly transfer small amounts of cash into the hands of poor people. These programs have achieved in their own terms striking successes, but their horizons have remained restricted to a society conceived in conventionally national terms. The problem of social obligation beyond the nation state is therefore an especially vexing problem for those, like myself, who hope to one day see the worst forms of poverty addressed through a global and not just national redistribution of income via such things as a global social protection floor or a worldwide basic income. The question I want to ask then is this. How can the more robust figurations of social obligation that we have long associated with the limited, exclusionary, and usually national figure of the social be reworked in a way that might give them more effective force and more purchase on the urgent political and ethical challenges of our time? Marcel Moss offered us a way of understanding solidarity as emerging from gift exchanges between interested social actors, suggesting a more dynamic way of thinking about social obligation and how it might travel and expand across social groups. This has broad applicability, and I think he was on to something very important by granting central social importance to processes of distribution rather than production. But our thinking about how processes of distribution might be tied to social obligation has been afflicted here by a pervasive dualism, either the gift or the market, as if there were only two modes of distribution, and sometimes even worse, as if one were social and the other somehow antisocial. Too often, our accustomed ways of linking solidarities to exchange leave us with only two alternatives, the grasping world of market competition and the inevitably smaller and weaker domain of gift giving, including charitable giving and humanitarian care. In Give a Man a Fish, I offered an alternative figure of distributive obligation in the form of the share. A share, I observed, is neither a gift nor a market exchange. Its defining feature is that it is based on a common ownership that is prior to all exchange. Sharing, therefore, entails a kind of social obligation that is rooted neither in reciprocity nor exchange, but instead in a form of commonality that precedes the act of distribution. It is based not so much on rights as on a perception of a rightful state of affairs. In the context of such an understanding, a strong social obligation of one owner to share is simply the obverse of the strong expectation of another co-owner to receive his or her due, what I called a rightful share. Anthropological understanding of sharing was first pioneered in so-called small-scale societies. But I show that logics of sharing and shareholding also apply in much larger collectivities. In particular, I explore forms of political assertion in contemporary Southern Africa that link a claim that wealth 
properly belongs to the nation as a whole, with specific demands for direct distribution of small cash payments from state to citizen. If Namibia, for instance, is in fact a rich country with vast deposits of diamonds and uranium, some activists ask, why should its citizens not receive at least some minimum share of that wealth via small monthly payments of so-called basic income? A powerful idea of original and common ownership is invoked here. But we immediately encounter the problem with which I began, which is the closed and exclusionary notion of a nation or a society as a kind of membership group. For if wealth is to be shared within an ownership group, as the rightful share conception requires, it is national citizenship that normally provides the foundation for such distributive claims, insofar as it is the collective nation that is reckoned a kind of owner. I argued in the book that this yields a potent and consequential kind of politics. But I also acknowledged that it has the kind of limits I referenced earlier. Impoverished South Africans, for instance, as members of the nation and owners of its wealth, may well demand a rightful share. But what about the numerous and generally even poorer Mozambicans and Zimbabweans who also live in South Africa? Such observations lead us to wonder if it is really the case that an obligation to share can apply only to a nationally or otherwise bounded membership group. And to ask, what then would such a social obligation look like if it were not conceived as an obligation toward a pre-given list of members? In the concluding chapter of the book, I suggested that what I called presence might serve as an alternative principle for social obligation. The topic of sharing, I pointed out, has to date been most impressively developed in anthropological studies of foragers. These studies make clear that the allocation of valued goods, such as meat, in these societies proceeds via aggressive demands for shares, so-called demand sharing. Demands that may properly be made by all those present at the occasion of distribution. The answer to the question, who is entitled to receive a distribution, is here given by the deceptively simple reply whoever is here. I also pointed to some signs that this power of presence, that is, being here, plays a more significant role than is often acknowledged in the contemporary provision of services by modern states. While we may think of services as linked to rights held by citizens, practical imperatives of governance often mean that legal certainties of citizenship and rights give way to other logics entailed in the day-to-day -day management and administration of populations, which, as Partha Chatterjee once pointed out, involves not the representation of citizens, but the government of what he called denizens. Which children should attend school? Who gets vaccinated for measles? Who gets toilets? The answers often proceed not according to a logic of right, but of practicality. Do we want undocumented kids not to be in school? What would they do then, and with what consequences? Do we really want to exclude a huge chunk of the population from our vaccination campaigns? Not legal abstractions, but brute sociological and immunological facts give the answers to such questions. Certain services must, for practical as much as ethical reasons, be extended not to whoever is an authorized member, but to whoever is here. I ended the book's conclusion with the suggestion that such claims rooted in presence, the blunt fact of being here, may be both more important and more politically promising than we have yet realized. Attending to the claims of presence, and not just those of membership, might, I said, point to new forms of distributive politics that could show us a way out of some of the dead ends into which we've been led by received political frameworks.
frameworks that give too much weight to laws and rights, and too little to forms of direct social presence and the social obligations that attach to them. But I confess that the idea was not at all well developed. Dropped into the conclusion without elaboration or support, it was more of a provocation than a proper argument. In my defense, I can say only that this was a conclusion specifically intended not to be conclusive. It was meant instead to offer an opening up of a field of issues. Not to say, so in conclusion, this is the answer, but something more like, wow, look at all the things we have to think about now. But I have been feeling lately that I really owed the reader a better attempt to work out the theme of presence as an alternative to the exclusionary logics of nation-state citizenship. So here I want to try to give some substance to this idea by developing an argument linking presence and the problem of social obligation. My opening move is to treat social obligation not as a philosophical problem, but as an anthropological or even geographical one. Lately, anthropologists have seemed all too ready to flee to the authority of philosophers when it comes time to take on big issues. But I suggest that we might better follow the example of Marcel Mauss here, thus the wildly immodest parallel with his famous Essay sur le don, implied by the subtitle of today's talk, an essay on the share. Moss famously identified three central obligations of the gift. The obligation to give, to receive, and to return. But he did not derive these from philosophical principles, nor did he advocate them as a normative stance. Instead, he described a set of sociological facts. For instance, that the receipt of a gift implies an obligation for a return an obligation nicely captured, he noted, in the Polynesian idea of a spirit that resides in the gift compelling its return. Note, he's not asking why people should feel obligation, or even why they do. He is taking as his starting place a set of observed facts. Across a wide range of cases, people feel that the gift itself impels return. Polynesians have a word for it, but they are not the only ones who feel the force of a set of obligations surrounding gifting. On the contrary, it is simply a sociological fact in Moses' account that the gift is everywhere bound up with these perceived obligations. This, he says, must be our starting place. In parallel fashion, we might ask, when is the act of sharing a common good in fact understood as an obligation? Note that the question is descriptive, not normative. When, that is, would it seem to the people in question improper or even impossible not to share? Note that such a perception does not mean that such obligations are always met, no more than we would naively suppose that all gifts are in fact reciprocated, only that it would seem improper for them not to be. And, can we identify certain general principles that across a wide range of ethnographic cases guide such judgments of an obligation to share? Principles like those most identified for the obligations of giving and receiving gifts. The obligation to share is often seen as an aspect of scale, characteristic of small groups with so-called face-to-face sociality. But this is neither sufficient since not all small-scale socialities provoke an obligation to share, nor is it necessary, since, as I will suggest, there are forms of obligation to share that operate at much higher levels of scale. We can be more precise, I argue, by specifying the conditions under which we may expect to find an obligation to share. In the most basic possible terms, I propose that these be specified as follows. An obligation to share is normally understood as such when the person whose claim might or might not be honored is both one of us, what I call the attribute of membership, and here among us, what I call the attribute of presence. 
My claim here is that one of these attributes without the other may have some force, but never the full force that comes with both membership and presence. Thus, a member of a foraging band, if not present, may have no relevant claim on the meat from a hunt. The meat is shared with those who are here. In the same way, one who is present, if not one of us, may not count as among those who must be attended to. Now, obviously, to put things so starkly is to ignore all the anthropological details that would determine such things as how and under what circumstances an obligation to share might be satisfactorily discharged, under what circumstances such an obligation might be refused or ignored, or why some people might receive larger or better shares than others. For there is nothing inherent in the obligation to share that implies either that all goods must be shared or that they must be shared equally. But as with Moses' obligations concerning giving, there may be something gained by identifying a very simple, formal set of conditions of obligation that underlie the more complicated, concrete forms that socially instituted practices of sharing inevitably take. In the modern West, we are familiar with the idea that at least some minimal obligations are owed toward fellow members of, as we say, our own society. That is, those who are both co-members of the abstract membership set that is the nation and co-present in the geographical space we call a country. Toward those who are in this way both members, one of us, and present, here among us, the fact of a certain kind of social obligation is clear, even if the specific forms it should take are not. Indeed, we sometimes regard these obligations to be of a similar kind, if of less intensity and moral depth, as those owed to members of our families. In contrast to such relatively strong obligation, we may note the weakness both of presence without membership, which yields only such fairly feeble forms of obligation toward physically proximate non-nationals as asylum proceedings, and of membership without presence, as when membership in humanity, functioning as a kind of analogical extension of the nation, is urgently asserted for distant and foreign others. Such a formulation imposes no real obligation upon us, more of an anemic tug of guilt, reproaching us that we really ought to feel a vague, compassionate concern for distant others who are, after all, still human, and therefore, in this rather diminished sense, one of us. This distinction between criteria of membership and those of presence is, I think, clarifying. But a quick turn to Southern Africa reveals how these two principles may be brought together in a more dynamic way than we in the West are used to, as presence and membership there often sit in a much more fluid relationship. In European societies, blood and soil have long served as principles of exclusion, such that one may be expelled or excluded either for having the wrong descent or for having been born in the wrong place. But Southern African societies are in the long durée, if not always at present, historically disinclined to kick out foreigners and highly sophisticated at devising means for incorporating them as what anthropologists sometimes call wealth in people. And in the service of securing such wealth in people, these societies have traditionally had a more supple and lively conception of how belonging may be linked to both territory, including soil, and bodily substances, including blood. Over time, foreigners have often been held to become durably attached to a place through things like labor, as their sweat mingles with the soil, and suffering, as shared suffering and spilled blood creates a spiritual unity rooted in the lived experience of co-dwelling. Here it is not juridical citizenship that is at issue, where you were born, who your parents were, but the material entailments of shared physical presence, suffering through the same drought, sweating into the same soil. Being here, 
in this long political tradition counts for a lot. And over time, such physical presence actually becomes both a kind of membership and an identity of substance. A neighbor is therefore a position from which strong claims can emerge. A gifted young Zambian ethnographer, Patience Mususa, has recently given a fine example of this from the Zambian Copper Belt. Having purchased for her own use a fixer-upper house in an urban neighborhood of Luantia, Mususa was soon approached by a neighborhood man who asked if he and his family might move into a spare room at the back of her property on the understanding that his wife would in exchange serve as a domestic worker. The ethnographer politely declined and explained that she did not need a domestic worker and did not intend to rent out the room. But when she took possession of the house a few weeks later, she found that the family had simply moved in. Her outrage was quickly checked, though, by the reactions of her neighbors, who asked just what then she did intend to do with that room. In their eyes, she realized, and I quote, to have an unoccupied building would have been too selfish indeed, and she reluctantly let the family stay. In a similar incident, she reported finding one day, upon her return home from work, two strange women helping themselves to some vegetables she had planted in her back garden. Unperturbed, the women cheerfully shouted, we're just stealing some vegetables from your garden. Surely, the ethnographer reflected, living alone, I could not have eaten all the vegetables in the garden. Such helpings, as she calls them, were not only common, they were in a real way, as she puts it, deemed acceptable. As Thomas Vidlock has rightly insisted, among the most important modalities of sharing must be reckoned the practice of, as he puts it, refraining from interfering with someone who is about to take something. This is the logic of demand sharing, and the rightfulness of the share is here rooted precisely in the simple principle of adjacency, the fact of being here, the status of being a neighbor. Yet the power of this social and political logic of presence, I suggest, remains significantly underanalyzed. Even as what I have called the membership principle, being one of us, is both explicitly acknowledged in law as citizenship and endlessly subject to critical analysis as the politics of identity. The presence principle, here among us, has largely remained at the level of common sense. We have not yet fully realized either how central it is to enabling actual norms of social obligation, or how richly constructed is the apparently self-evident condition of being present, of being here. In the next section, therefore, I turn to the question of what might be gained through the conceptual and political reworking of the idea of presence as the basis for a modern day politics of sharing. This raises, of course, the challenge of moving from the sort of literal face-to-face -face presence that we see in the forager band or in that Copper Belt neighborhood to a reworked and expanded concept more suitable to modern distributive politics. This means, first of all, addressing the problem of scale. An obligation to share is most readily grasped at the microsocial level of personal interaction. And we have a harder time imagining how it might apply to larger scales. But why is this? And why do we so easily imagine membership, in contrast, as capable of being scaled up to hundreds of millions of people? As in the idea of national citizenship, uniting people in a way that is analogous to membership in a family. What would a similarly scaled up conception of presence look like? In fact, the modern politics of state service delivery reveals at least certain elements of the sort of conception of presence that we need. As I observed earlier, in many contexts, it is the practical administration of denizens rather than the legal rights of citizens that drives at least certain sorts of service provision. As Anne Maria Mahulu has shown for South Africa, direct action by people lacking legal rights, such as squatters building houses illegally in places they have no rights to build, 
has often amounted to an extremely effective political strategy, both in the apartheid period and much more recently. More broadly, service delivery demands of all kinds, for housing, for electricity, for water, for road maintenance, have generally been the most effective forms of popular politics in South Africa in recent years. This has involved medical services, as well as infrastructural struggles around things like sanitation and water. South Africa has become famous for a fierce and theatrical politics of toilets, for instance, while battles over household water delivery are resolved through grudging acknowledgments that even illegal settlers who are in official logics not supposed to exist will still die without water, and that cholera has an epidemiology that follows its own laws stubbornly refusing to distinguish between a South African and a Mozambican. All of these forms of political assertion and pragmatic accommodation have drawn their force not from the claims of citizenship, but those of presence. The problems of government that they have presented have involved less adjudicating the rights belonging to members than coping with the material demands of what we might term adjacency. Consider for a moment the democratic town hall meeting as a kind of image of the essence of political membership, right? That Vermont town hall meeting where everybody gets together and collectively makes decisions. An intimate sociality that we imaginatively scale up to the level of the nation state as a picture of a participatory political community. In contrast, let me offer an alternative image for the essence of presence, not membership, but presence. The alternative image I offer you is the African minibus taxi. These local taxis are known by various names across the continent, Makombi, Matatu, Dala Dala, Trotro, but they have an instantly recognizable set of features. Inevitably, they are hopelessly overloaded with passengers stuffed in like olives in a jar pressed up against each other. They are hot, sweaty, uncomfortable, but they are also sites of a kind of shared sociality, where certain minimum standards of good manners and civil conduct are almost always respected. I offer this as an image of sociality understood as a kind of accidental co-presence, as opposed to a community of membership founded on a shared identity. It involves a sociality rooted in involuntary and haphazard association, linked neither by a unity of social kind or shared substance, like a family, nor one of shared interest or affiliation, like a club. The passengers have only an incidental and contingent relation to each other. They are merely adjacent. But this adjacency imposes a non-trivial sociality, that entails real obligations and a more or less continuous set of pragmatic adjustments. Each time new passengers board, the old ones must rearrange themselves, give way, yield a precious share of that scarce, tightly packed space. There is no social contract here, not even any real reciprocity. It is rather something more like demand sharing. When new passengers enter the vehicle, we are obliged. We feel we must give up at least some space, must make ourselves less comfortable, simply because someone else with the same needs as we has appeared. This image may help us to contrast my approach to sharing as obligation with the humanitarian reason described by Didier Fassin. Humanitarian action in his account, involves a mode of ethical contemplation through which feelings of empathy and compassion for strangers move us to generosity. Encountering a true obligation, though, is not a matter of compassion and may as likely provoke annoyance or anger. Indeed, I suggest that irritation rather than pity is often the sign of real obligation. Consider when your no good brother fails to pay his rent because he spent all his money on drugs and now he wants to come and sleep on your couch and probably throw up on it like he did last time and for sure to mess up your apartment for God knows how long. And what do you say? 
Not, oh, I feel so sorry for him that I am moved to generosity. But probably something more like, how incredibly annoying. But what can I do? He's my brother. That is what real obligation feels like. Indeed, as the geographers Clive Barnett and David Land have observed, when we make actual allocative decisions, it is normally not as isolated, contemplative, Kantian subjects, but in real social contexts, where thinking about sharing unfolds in the push and shove of active social relationships and active claims and demands. And it is these relationships and these active claims and expectations, not abstract ethical reasoning, that actually drive allocative outcomes, often leaving us feeling, as in the case of the no good brother, as if we had no real choice. Like giving way in the crowded minibus, we are not simply acting out of a discretionary and beneficent generosity. We are under real obligation, and obligation is obligatory. Note, too, that while I've invoked biological contagion as one sort of issue of adjacency, the relation of presence is not fundamentally a biological one, but a social one. This is not a matter of the so-called bare life that Agamben linked to the image of the camp, a zone of merely animal life socially separate from us. Rather, it is the most elementary sort of social relation that is at issue. Like in the minibus, we are dealing with the other who presses up against you and therefore must be dealt with. It is a matter not of humanity, but of the person next to you. As the great G.K. Chesterton expressed it, and I quote, we make our friends, we make our enemies, but God makes our next door neighbor. Hence he comes to us clad in all the careless terrors of nature. He is as strange as the stars, as reckless and indifferent as the rain. That is why the old religions and the old scriptural language showed so sharp a wisdom when they spoke not of one's duty toward humanity, but one's duty toward one's neighbor." End quote. Just as the supposition that the only alternative to the market is the gift has blinded us to other distributive principles, like the share, so may the presumption that the only alternative to the exclusions of national or societal membership is a universalist or cosmopolitan humanism have blinded us to other possible figurations of social obligation. Demands for service delivery of the kind, as I've noted, that are made by denizens as readily as citizens are, in fact, a scaling up of precisely the sorts of demands that proceed from these relations of neighborly pressing up against of what I have called adjacency. Because we're here, say new urbanites across the great metropolitan centers of the global south, because we're here, we must have toilets. We must have clean water. Our children must go to school. We must be, in some minimal sense, attended to, even served. And in some grudging way, they usually are. Now let me be clear. Such acknowledgments of the claims of presence are often absolutely minimal and in no way satisfactory. They are generally conceded only with the greatest reluctance, and they normally come with explicit limitations and undisguised inequalities in relation to the claims of full membership that are available to citizens. But it is also true that such concessions to presence in the domain of service delivery and elsewhere do lead to real, if unequal, distributions of resources. They result, that is, in a real yielding of shares. Just as you really must make room in the crowded minibus, even if you're cursing under your breath, so even the most reluctant citizens must pay the taxes that enable poor migrant children to go to school, even as they may at the same time deny migrants political rights or even denounce their very existence. The significant distributive results achieved in recent years by claims rooted in presence may perhaps suggest a starting point for a political strategy that would work toward more inclusive and universalistic understandings of presence. Perhaps, that is, 
a more robust and well-thought-out understanding of how being here among us leads to social obligations might enable the development of a politics aimed at expanding those obligations and broadening their reach. If that seems implausible, consider the way that similarly unsatisfactory and unequal constructions of membership provided starting points for more universalistic and progressive constructions of us, as modern universalistic national citizenship gradually replaced more restrictive conceptions, such as that women were citizens but not voters, or that a black American counted as three-fifths of a human being. Perhaps our understandings of presence, of being here among us, stand ready for a similarly radical inclusionary expansion. If so, what might emerge is what we could think of as a two-dimensional politics, where one dimension is already very familiar to us and the other much less so, and thus in need of more development and emphasis. The first familiar dimension involves continuing to work the axis of membership, aiming to extend the sense of us via a politics of expanded memberships and broadened solidarities. The second, less familiar one, would involve working to expand the sense of here and among us, thus strengthening the political claims of presence. Recent work on so-called geographies of generosity and caring at a distance has discussed the ethical problem of the so-called distant stranger and the political challenge of finding ways of inducing citizens of affluent northern societies to develop a stronger sense of responsibility toward distant southern others. But instead of asking how we can inculcate a strong sense of responsibility toward others who are not present, which I have suggested never seems to work very well, perhaps we might better ask how those others can in fact be rendered present. What might such a strategy look like? We must start with the observation that presence is never a simple physical fact but rather always depends on elaborate commonsensical constructions that allow some people and things to count as here, and others, though equally or even more proximate, as not here. As a recent BBC piece on borders recently asked, why should UK citizens living in Dover owe more to the inhabitants of Middlesbrough, North England, 260 miles away, than to refugees in a Calais camp that is just 26 miles away. One is here and the other is not. And if some who are very near indeed to us are in this way deemed to lack presence by being on the wrong side of an imaginary line, it is also true that even being on the right side of the line has often not sufficed to allow a foreigner to count as here and among us. A kind of social invisibility as ethnographers of the abject have long documented, often makes it possible for us to fail to recognize the presence even of people who are right in front of us. Presence, that is, is neither literal nor self-evident. It must be acknowledged as such through a political and social process of recognition. How can we help ensure that such recognition occurs? An effective strategy here has often been to focus on economic interdependencies, and especially on how the products that we all consume link us to others. Others who may be invisible to us, but whose labor is the condition of our own existence or prosperity. In this spirit, when I teach an introduction to anthropology course for undergraduates, I use Seth Holmes's book, Fresh Fruit, Broken Bodies, to force students to think about migrant farm laborers who are in fact not members of US political society conceived as a nation of legal citizens, but who are, if sometimes invisibly, here among us. Holmes's chief technique for making them visible as here among us, rendering them present in my terms, is to again and again point to the connection between their labor and our dependence on the concrete products of that labor. That crisp green salad you ate for lunch was picked by someone we must attend to, someone who is here among us. I do the same thing in my teaching about Africa. When I invite students to contemplate the harsh labor of Zambian mine workers, 
as it is manifested right before them in the copper wires that illuminate their classrooms. In spite of great geographical distance, I render the mine workers present in the same way that Holmes does for the farm workers who are only an hour away from where I teach at Stanford. Barbara Ehrenreich has recently made a similar sort of argument. We owe a social obligation, she says, what she styles a kind of gratitude, to many who lie beyond our visible social circles. When we sit down to a meal, we should ask ourselves about, as she puts it, the whole communities of people, many of them with aching backs, who made it possible. Who picked the lettuce in the fields, she asked, processed the standing rib roast, drove those products to the stores, stacked them on the supermarket shelves, and of course prepared them and brought them to the table. Such critical strategies do enable us to argue from a kind of presence, even when the political and cultural membership of national citizenship is absent. But as a foundation for social obligation, labor, as I emphasized in Give a Man a Fish, labor may let us down as completely as the nation form does in these times of mass structural unemployment. Let us imagine, for instance, that the sore-backed workers whom Ehrenreich describes were suddenly replaced by lettuce-picking robots, something that is not difficult to imagine these days. Would my social obligations to them disappear when they move from working poor to unemployed poor? When my lettuce no longer passes through their hands, should I no longer think of them? I don't think so, and I don't think Barbara Ehrenreich thinks so. I think she's doing what I do in my class, using the very material connection via labor as a convenient club to beat the reader over the head into recognizing that social obligation exists. But surely our obligation to those who live among us is not really limited only to those who perform services for us, else we would be obliged only to the healthy and able-bodied members of poor communities and not to the sick and disabled. The division of labor here is a convenient example of social mutuality, but not its source or foundation. And if that is the case, then social obligation is not really a kind of fee paid in reciprocity for services rendered, but something else entirely. Not the contractual, I owe you X because you have given me Y, but something more like the foragers, of course you will join the meal because you're hungry, and you are here. In fact, participation in the production process seems to be becoming a weaker and weaker sort of ground for making distributive claims, as the labor migrant is increasingly replaced by the refugee, the asylum seeker, the migrant whose labor is expressly not needed and who must try to achieve recognition in other ways. Instead, then, we will need to turn to other features of presence that are much less developed in our critical practice. These features include such things as shared need, to be sure, need that is in, as evident in the demand for social and medical services in modern contexts of immigration as it is in the collective hunger of the foraging band. But they also include all forms of shared vulnerability and suffering, and most generally, all the shared problems and possibilities of involuntary co-presence. And that we must conceive that co-presence in a way that goes beyond literal bodily presence at whatever scale, to also consider electronically mediated forms of social presence. If social intimacy today is, as it seems, becoming ever less bound to face-to-face -to -face and flesh-to-flesh -flesh interactions, we need to be open to understanding forms of being here among us that may not reference literal physical space, but instead the space analogs of online communities. The declining significance of literal physical presence in a social media age may here start to become recognizable as an opportunity and not only a hazard. By way of conclusion, let me briefly pose the question, where might such an enhanced and expanded politics of presence lead? In the most hopeful case, I would like to think that it might lead all of us through more or less direct paths to stronger and more robust norms of social obligation.
that might be able to break out of the conventional nation-state frame that has for so long colonized our understandings of sociality and obligation alike. If so, such a shift might in a small way help open the door to political outcomes that now seem out of reach, perhaps even including the development of the kind of institutions of global redistribution I mentioned at the start, like a worldwide social protection floor or a planetary universal basic income. But even if this is, in the end, too optimistic, that is, even if the direct political payoffs of such an intellectual project are more meager or far off than I have perhaps made them sound here, I do think there is important intellectual work waiting to be done on this issue. In recent decades, we've spent a lot of critical and political energy rethinking who counts as us. We've recognized that taken-for-granted social identities are in fact elaborate and consequential constructions whose reworking must be at the heart of our politics. We now need an equal dedication to the problem of what counts as here, recognizing that common sense notions of presence, the idea that some people simply are here among us while others are not, are also elaborate constructions. They too require a reworking that ought to be central both to contemporary politics and to engaged intellectual life. And in the long run, perhaps it is not too much to hope that such an endeavor just might help us to find ways of reckoning transnational social obligation that would go beyond such bland and powerless assertions of common identity as humanity and help us to arrive at a more robust sense of a real lived commonality. Armed with such a sense, we might start to build a world within which, for all of us, as for foragers sitting down to a shared meal, being there might be enough. In such a world, indeed, we might be able to begin to appreciate that full richness of that state of involuntary mutual being that Hannah Arendt called plurality, which she once characterized as the joy of inhabiting, together with others, a world whose reality is guaranteed for each by the presence of all.